This paper really has two major prongs to it. The first one is trying to understand why microbes work as cancer diagnostics and prognostics at all, including trying to quantify exactly how many cancer microbes there may be, both their diversity and their overall abundance. The second major prong of the paper is trying to understand how cancer microbes, especially those that are intratumoral and intracellular in particular, affect our understanding and definition of cancer clonal evolution. With regard to the first prong, we first set out in order to try to understand why microbes are useful. Now there's been a lot of work done in the cancer genomics field, especially in the area of liquid biopsies, trying to understand how inclusion of many kinds of analytes can increase the sensitivity of a test even when any individual analyte is rare or lowly abundant. One way of thinking about this is playing basketball where you have many shots on goal. If you're standing on the other side of the basketball court and taking an individual shot, the percentage of any individual shot making it into the hoop on the other side of the court is low. But if you increase the number of shots that you're taking to a thousand, then the probability that you're going to make at least one of them dramatically increases. Similarly, what we're observing is that even though microbes, both in tumor tissues and those whose DNA are found in trace amounts in blood, their inherent diversity increases the number of analytes that are being detected at any one time. Now, microbes can also be found in much higher abundances in the gut. And this is where many of the first cancer diagnostics have been identified. This includes precancer diagnostics including certain genetic syndromes like familial adenomatosis polyposis, also known as FAP, that commonly predispose patients to colorectal cancer by age 40. What was notable in that particular paper was that patients who developed these many polyps frequently had biofilms that contained carcinogenic bacteria. And these biofilms were actually not only harbored, but allowed these bacteria to persist and secrete genotoxins that could actually disrupt local DNA of colonic epithelial cells, potentially leading to cancer. On the cancer diagnostics end, there have been two major surveys in this space. The first one coming from our group, which was published in Nature in March of 2020, where we surveyed the Cancer Genome Atlas's compendium of DNA and RNA data in order to establish the first cancer microbiome atlas. Over 10,000 patients, 32 cancer types, um, and a variety of different sample types from tumor tissue to adjacent normal tissue, to also blood. A few months later, there was another group at the Weizmann that published a paper in Science that confirmed many of these findings, specifically in tumor tissue, which is that each cancer type appears to have a unique cancer microbiome associated with it. And this is persistent even after comprehensive efforts to identify and remove contaminants. In that particular case, they included over 800 contamination controls for 1,010 tumors, effectively concluding that solely using microbial information, it was possible to discern the kind of cancer or tissue type that a patient um, had. The second major prong of this paper focused on the concept of cancer clonal evolution, which is largely considered a sterile process, but likely is incorrectly considered one. Cancer clonal evolution is useful for modeling tumor regenesis, especially on the basis of genetic mutations that transform a benign tissue into a malignant one. At the same time, cancer clonal evolution is a very useful model for understanding why cancers will eventually develop resistance to many therapies. A classic example of this is when an EGFR mutated cancer is given a selective EGFR inhibition therapy. Those cells that contain the EGFR mutation die off as a result of the therapy, but the cells that do not have the EGFR mutation clonally expand leading to later resistance and perhaps metastasis, depending on the patient, months to years later after the therapy, even after initial successful results where it appears that the tumor may fade. Now, this model, unfortunately, cannot account for many situations when microbes can contribute to the efficacy of cancer therapy, ranging from chemotherapy to radiotherapy to immunotherapy. A classic example of this is gemcitabine, based off of a 2017 paper that came out of the Weizmann and Broad Institutes where they noted that more than 300 species of bacteria, 98% of which belong to gamma proteobacteria, contained a long isoform of cytidine deaminase, which is capable of enzymatically degrading gemcitabine, the gold standard chemotherapy given to pancreatic cancer patients as well as lung cancer patients. And they noted that they could cultivate these bacteria from patients' tumors and recall culture them with new cancer cells while conferring resistance to gemcitabine. 
Importantly, the classic model of cancer clonal evolution cannot take any of these matters into account because it's supposed to be a sterile theory. Now, this sort of effect is also important when considering how microbes influence cancer cell state. Literature over the last five to 10 years has made it very clear that microbes can impact every layer of cancer information. It can impact its cancer genome through mutagenesis, of ge through secretion of genotoxins. It can impact its transcriptome, whether it's an extracellular bacterium next to a cancer cell or an invading bacterium inside of a cancer cell. It can even contribute to its proteome, as noticed in a Nature paper published in 2021, where intracellular bacteria actually had bacterial peptides, they were contributing bacterial peptides that were later displayed on MHC1 and 2 molecules on the surface of cancer cells and immune cells, and even harvesting T cells from these same patient's tumors and co-culturing them with these bacterial peptides led the T cells to release interferon gamma, suggesting that these T cells were specifically recognizing the same bacterial peptides that were previously present on the surface of these cancer cells from these same patients. Now, the idea that microbes can affect the genome, the transcriptome, the proteome, and the metabolome, since they are metabolically active and there's good data suggesting that microbes inside of tumors can degrade or metabolize certain kinds of xenobiotics, including molecules that humans cannot degrade, it highly suggests that microbes need to be included in basic models of cancer clonal evolution. A challenge though, and an important challenge at that, is that microbes represent distinct genetic entities from that of cancer, meaning that they can experience different clonal selection pressures that are disjoint from the ones that cancer will experience. Going back to the EGFR example, if you gave a tumor an EGFR inhibitor, it would very likely apply a clonal selection pressure on the tumor, especially for EGFR mutated cells. At the same time, that EGFR inhibitor would not likely apply a very strong selection pressure on intratumoral microbes. Conversely, if you gave an antibiotic to that same patient, there would be a very strong clonal selection pressure on the microbes, especially depending on which kind of antibiotic you gave for different kinds for different classes of microbes. But at the same time, there would not be a very strong clonal selection pressure necessarily on the cancer cells themselves, suggesting that this is disjoint clonal selection that's occurring. Now, at the same time, there can be joint clonal selection. One can imagine that in a tumor with limited resources and fast-growing cells, there is constant competition for nutrients. It is possible, especially considering chemical limitations like oxygen gradients, pH gradients, each of which affect structural placement of tumors and how they develop, as well as microbes, at least from what we observe in nature, then it's very likely that these are going to act as joint selection pressures against both tumor cells and microbes simultaneously. Individual clones within a given clonal type are largely considered homogenous. However, it is very possible, if not very likely, that microbes inside of a tumor vary in their spatial placement, and they may even vary amongst different clones. What I mean by that is that if you have three kinds of bacteria that are infecting the same clonal type, but each changing the phenotype of those individual cells within the same clone, then you are no longer having this homogeneity within a given clone. We have termed this in the paper microbial intraclonal diversity, or MIDS for short. And we believe that it will be important in the future in order to include microbial information, in part because of MIDS and in part because of these other aspects that have been mentioned previously, in order to better understand how multi-species clonal evolution occurs and can predict therapeutic resistance and metastasis.